going to explore alternative mark making techniques utilizing drawing, printmaking, stencils, and a semic. Okay, so right. so materials include ink, acrylic, charcoal, pencil pastels, and alternative tools. And you can learn more about Kim at KimKissingerMarino.com. And that link is in the email that I sent out to everybody. So check out her work. And without further ado, well, thank you. Thank you, thank you for having me. Uh, I met Amy at the at her uh, at her frame shop. I'm relatively new to the area. I've been here a few years, uh, but just just getting back into the community, art community. I'm from Champaign Urbana originally, and so I've been here a short time, but starting to get meeting more artists. Um, I've been helping my husband get our business going again, and so so I really uh, appreciate the opportunity. Um, so obviously I'm an abstract artist. Um, I have a couple of things over here if you would like to look at them later. Um, I have what I call the sample book, which is um, I keep leftover pieces of paintings and drawings, and I just keep a book of them. And so these are, I guess, an inspiration book, you could say. Uh, but I found this to be really useful for me to go back. Uh, also, in terms of mark making, this is a book that I made from a, a, a workshop that I attended on mark making and calligraphy. And it has a variety of different mark making ideas in here, or samples that I made. Um, my biography is here with the business card, and I have a little sign-up sheet if you'd like to get an occasional email when I have a show, or if you'd like to be Facebook friends, I'd be glad for that as well. So to get started, um, to tell you a little bit more about me, I was raised on a farm in Southern Indiana, and I came to art through the women of my family. Um, they were artisans, my mother knits, crochet, or does needlepoint, my grandmother was an ex did extensive quilting, uh, we had other cultures in the family, and so on the farm, that was what we did at the time. I'm of that generation, not younger, where we had all the electronics, because we didn't have any of that. So I, I come to painting from a craft viewpoint, if you will. And so my interest in mark making started out with stitches. And so it's the stitches of quilting that interest me, the lines. And then the French knots of embroidery. And so I spent a good bit of my young year, younger years uh, doing embroidery and cruel. Never was really very good at knitting. Um, but that's where I came to my heart. And I realized that as an adult now, that my mark making is reflective of my younger years. And I see things in my work that I saw when I was a young girl. So that's a little bit about me. Um, I thought we'd just take a couple of minutes, just run through a little history of mark making. I mean, we're all artists and we all make marks. That's, that's just the way it is. If you paint, if you draw, watercolor, anything you do, a mark is you know, what we do. So some of the early marks were cave paintings, a little charcoal, a little clay, and this was a, a document of whatever was going on at the time. And of course we all are familiar with Chinese calligraphy, old calligraphy, and new. And then of course the Egyptians were the masters of mark making with their hieroglyphic language. And then as time went by, we moved into the Renaissance and the painting became more realistic. And mark making was more of a documentation of reality at this point. Some beautiful work on this dress is all hand marks through here. But what you can see in the background here are some abstract scallops in this painting. And so the artist also was reflecting the subject matter at the same time. And then as we move forward to the Impressionists, things began to change. And marks began to take uh, a forward seat, if you will, uh, in the Impressionist era. Lines, marks, uh, 
things begin to, to not be smooth and realistic anymore. George Surratt, um, we have pointillism. So again, the line begins to break down even further now into dots. And then the master of, of mark making, Vincent van Gogh, uh, Starry Night, one of the famous paintings, just set the art world on its ear. People did, well, no pun intended. Uh, uh, people didn't know what to make of this. It was so different. And then again, his self-portrait, which is, this is not a great reproduction, but the amount of lines. And it's, I also read that he was influenced by calligraphy. And when I read that, I thought, I think that's possible because of the lines. He didn't have a lyrical line, he had a straight line. But I could see it after I read it. And then as we move through time, 1900s, we have Matisse with his cutouts. And these were his duplicate mark making as shapes, obviously. But I thought, I just, I so appreciate this work for its simplicity. And another Matisse, lesser known, this is called the swimming pool. And again, the mark making is communicating the message of the piece. It looks like, it feels like a swimming pool to me. I tend towards minimalism, and so that appeals to me. So this is a piece of Asemic writing. This is Emily Dickinson from 1959. Asemic writing is mark making that resembles writing or language but isn't. A semic meaning no meaning. And so if you Google that, you come up with all kinds of artwork that looks like writing, but isn't writing. And it's very interesting. There's also some Facebook there's also some Facebook groups strictly for this. What was she doing there when she did that? I don't know. But it's not actually it's not actually writing. So to go a little further through time, a little more modern, um, I chose Jackson Pollock, but not the splatter paintings. Mm. This is the paintings that were right before he began to splatter. Um, this is the piece that he made for Peggy Guggenheim that hung in her New York apartment. And I think that it looks like the painting is just about to explode. And so I think I can see the splatters coming in, this, in the energy of this painting. The Very exciting, and this is a really big painting too. A modern artist, um, Bryce Martin, uh, paints, as you can see here, with the paintbrush attached to a long. Uh, he uses a stick, but he he very much is influenced by calligraphy, so his marks have that lyrical mark that goes more with calligraphy. But he's a he's a contemporary artist. He's alive today. But his work with a stick. It's with a brush on the end of a stick. Um, I have one to demonstrate. You'll see the difference in between that and a regular stick. A regular, sorry, a brush. These are just brush marks, calligraphy marks which I thought since we were talking about calligraphy of various artists, it would be interesting to look at how someone breaks down calligraphy marks. So many different kinds. And then we have some other contemporary artists. This artist is a Danish artist and she paints with her hair. And so again, what her end result paintings are, are they look a great deal like calligraphy, but we're not going to paint with hair today. So. <laughs> she puts paint on her head. Exactly. Oh. Performance oh. artist. Oh, yeah, uh -huh. she is, isn't it? Wow. And then this gentleman paints with his feet only. So again, his marks are reflective of his feet and the way that he 
paints with his feet only. And then finally we have a French artist who works with giant brushes. I think this just looks like so much fun. <laughs> I think it's whatever they think is going to be different. Than yeah, that's right. I was thinking too. Oh. I just want to be thirty dollars again. <laughs> yeah, this will take a lot of paint. <laughs> Where do you get a brush? Just like roughly they had on Facebook, this pig. Did you see where that pig was painting? Oh, I have seen the pig that paints. Uh -huh. <laughs> a pig and a dog. They're trying everything now to impress people. <laughs> so, so we've looked at some mark making. So what is mark making? I mean, we all have individual marks that we made. And our first marks were whatever marks we made on paper as small children. Our first legible marks were our signature, which may have changed over time, but it had probably uh, remained similar to your earlier signatures. And again, the word mark, in a time of illiteracy, an X was the mark if you couldn't sign your name. And so we all carry forward, and I think in our art, we see things in one painting that is reflected in an earlier painting, uh, whether it's a technique mark or something like that. And so our marks continue to evolve through time. So my, my purpose today is really just to kind of open the door to experimental mark making. Um, I am fascinated by marks. I always have been. And so I use a variety of alternative methods. I'm not going to do a complete piece. I'm just going to show you different techniques that I found along the way. And maybe one or two you can incorporate in your work or just be entertained by by some uh, new ideas. So, without further ado, um, I have a variety of tools that I use. I primarily work in acrylic, but I also work in oil and cold wax, um, which is a really nice uh, medium because it has a lot of body. So, just to start out, um, you said oil and what? Cold wax. This is a brush that I made out of a broom. And so I'm able to use this in any way. Just to get a variety of different marks like that. This is just an old broom I took apart. Uh, and then I also, one of my favorite tools are cardboard squares. I'm a really low cost kind of artist. So um, these are just cardboard. I have my favorites. And so these are really fun for making all kinds of marks like that. And then I find for me as an artist, one of the things I like to do is I also like print making. So I may lay down a mark, pick it back up, and lay it down again in a new way. I don't know if you can see. Can you see? Yeah. I also use these little wooden blocks. These are balsa wood. Very simple again, very, very simple tools. So it's a little awkward for me, so you have to bear with me. Get up and move it. I don't have a lot of paint on there. But just to be able to repeat uh, an idea or a mark. I use palette, palette knives a lot, which I'm sure some of you do as well. I have my own favorite grubby ones that I use all the time. So if I come in with a heavier mark and then come back through, or you 
use my brush. It's just endless. And I also have some tools that I make, which are out of plastic. I use these like paint brushes. this in my work, but I did make this so that we could see it. This is a brush similar to Bryce Martin's brush. So it's amazing the difference between a brush, using your brush this way, Anything to get the paint on the canvas. And I also use brushes. That's just something that I've always liked. You like what? Dots. Dots. Polka dots. Or any kind of dot, actually. Dots. So if I put that in, and I come back to my old friend, the wax paper. tools that I use that these um, these spatulas I actually actually use these for the cold wax and oil because you're working with a really heavy material very thick um, but I found that I really like it for acrylic as well so if you want to do layers Lends itself to my work. But if we put a little more red up here. This one, but I have some that I have made, yeah. and they can bring up a, a pattern like that. She I, wants to steal that for you. She unique. <laughs> Pardon me. She wants to steal that one before you leave. Oh, <laughs> I think it's from a uh, Skinny Girl Stencils. I think is her name. Oh, uh, yeah. I can let Amy know. This is one that I made. 
And all I do, oh, I just skip this plastic. It, it's really lightweight. And just cut it out. Where, where do you get the plastic? I think I got that at Blick. Oh, okay. Um, you can probably get that at Michael's or Hobby Lobby. Sure. Yes. Um, I, I had a little bit of a hard time finding it, and I, I believe I found it at Blick. He probably used transparency paper, too. Yes, yeah, transparency paper. You can yeah. use pretty much anything. So this is one I made. The which one? I was looking at your green stencil there. You use that in, in mechanical stuff. Oh, here, uh huh. Yes. Yeah, that's just a template. Yeah, that's that. just a template. I use that in some of my stuff. I didn't do a very good job. But I hadn't seen any stencils in circles and stuff like that. Yeah, so online. I think, I don't know if it's Stencil Girl. Maybe it's Stencil Girl. Then to reprint. Get a little better coverage here. This is just a, like an architect. Designs. Let's see what else I have in this box just before we leave it. What do you normally ask for your gallery wrap paintings on there in your 12 by 12? Um, what do I ask? Charge for them? What do I charge for them? Um, those are probably $300, something like that. And I, I keep my ruined brushes, and unfortunately I, I have ruined brushes, but I like to use them. Then these are kitchen spatulas. I think that's a cake icing thing. Well, I'm relatively new to this area. Uh, when I was in Champaign-Urbana, I showed at galleries there, solo shows. Uh, I currently have a solo show at the Renaissance Hotel down on 70 right now. And then I'll have a, a solo show um, out in Chesterfield in July and August. And then I've done a few jury shows. Uh, Soulard Gallery, my studio is in Soulard. So I'm just kind of getting my feet under me in St. Louis. I also have my favorite printing rags. So I use these. They're very stiff and they're full of paint, but they're one of my favorite tools. What is that again? It's a rag. 
It's me for just a while. It's it's full of pain. Okay. If I just have these faded old rags. <laughs> full of pain. I don't ever want anyone to clean my studio because they might throw them away. Yeah. <laughs> Another stencil idea, very simple, are little squares. This is modeling paste on this one. Oh, sorry, Amy. No, you're fine. So you can just dry brush it and get a nice texture or marks on for your painting. And then also, sometimes I use it and print with it. Actually need a little softer background to print this. Let's let's see if it works. Oh, it didn't. It, you need a piece of paper with something soft under it. Um, let's reverse the process here. Let's put the paper. We'll put the paper on the stencil or on the texture and try to print it that way. So you can pick it up that way. But I like the modeling paste, I use it in my work. These are glass beads, it's a texture that you can get in a jar, and they're little shiny glass beads. And then this is uh, called fiber. It's actually like paper. And any of these, if you have enough paint on it, you can print it. Then this last is pumice, which I also use in my work, which can kind of give you a really fun texture there too. So put it. Where do you get the fiber? Um, Art Mart uh, down on Hanley Road has it. It's not uncommon. It's just in a, a jar. It's like a, yeah, it's like in a modeling paste jar. Yeah. And the glass beads as well. Michael's might have it. Now, are you saying you, you put that right on your artwork or are you using that as a, as a block print? Both. 
I print and paint. Um, these, some of these marks are printed and some of them are painted. Um, in this one, there's painting and then there's printing. I come in and print over the top. So it's kind of bold. You press, you press your... Um, Whatever I'm using, I load it with paint okay. and then use it and, and print over the top of the, of the paint. Um, another idea is to draw with glue. This is just craft glue and you can use that and draw designs and then come in and paint over those, or, or print with them as well. And that's just regular old craft glue that you get at any art supply store. Um, but it gives a little bit of a raised texture. Um, it gives you a nice, nice mark. You, your marks show up this way if you go at it like that. Well, I think that is most of my tricks that I have for painting. Um, anybody have any other questions about the works or anything? The pink ones have pumice on them. If you we're interested in seeing what the pumice looks like. Um, I took the pumice and uh, pressed it through a screen to make these raised areas. She's saying it has what on it? Pumice. Pumice? Pumice, yes. So can you get the, the pumice? What pumice? Focused in North St. Louis County, Northside Art Association is a nonprofit 501c3 arts organization that serves local artists through community exposure, networking, education, and peer interaction. Learn more about Northside Art Association at www.northsideartassociation.org.